Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. All right, that's enough. Enough fellowship and happiness. <laughs> Okay, when the pastor's mother's ready. Okay, now we're ready to go. <laughs> um, if you have your Bible with you, open up to Psalm chapter 20. I thought we'd, uh, I'd read this aloud and we can, you can follow along together. We're going to read the entire Psalm, Psalm 20. It's a great, uh, a great psalm, and I, 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 what prompted me to read it is that... Uh, Ed Barton, I popped in on the high school fellowship a few weeks ago, and he read this, and I thought, wow, what a great, great psalm. And so I thought I'd share it with all of us. Psalm 20 says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God, of the God of Jacob, defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. May he grant you according to your heart's desire. You can all say amen to that one, all right? And fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heavens with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the King answer us when we call. Isn't that just encouraging? Let's stand together and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the encouragement of your word, Lord. How you are for us, Lord, as we follow you. And follow the call and the purpose that you have for us. Lord, may you just pour out your blessing upon us. And may we respond to you with love to you and um, with obedience to you, Lord. We love you, Lord, and may we, we just receive our worship now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is unfailing love 
that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me praise your name and we thank you. Lord, we are so grateful for drawing us to you. We are grateful that we get to sing these songs, Lord, as, as something that you have accomplished in our hearts. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for all that you are to us. We pray that you're glorified or that you're honored deep from our hearts. We want to bless your name. Lord Jesus, give us hearts to do that tonight. Bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue in worship. Boast in anything 
no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom.
stand as we sing. To the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach, glad be there. Then you will call me someday to my home far away. cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening again. I'm going to um, be leading us in prayer this evening. <clears throat> and uh, what we're going to be praying for tonight are the ministries in our, in our body here at Calvary Chapel, Turlock. So um, before we get into prayer, I'll make one announcement. Uh, Mike, if you can just put on the the slide on the screen for the home fellowship. Just want to give you guys a reminder in case you weren't here this morning of uh, opportunities to join a home uh, fellowship group. And so we have them in Denair, Empire, and Turlock. And uh, there are flyers, I believe, uh, on the, in the foyer. Um, in the foyer. Uh, so go ahead and pick one of those up and uh, we inc highly encourage you to join one of them. So let's uh, go to the Lord and pray for the ministries of our church. Will you join me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for for this body, Lord, for this, what you have put together here, Lord, we know it's by your hand and by your grace that you have formed this body of believers, Lord, who, who desire to know you and who you love, Lord. And we thank you for um, the teaching ministries, Lord, uh, starting with our Pastor Rob. Lord, we pray that you would continue to have your hand upon him and give him wisdom. Um, Thank you so much for his diligence and his faithfulness, Lord, uh, to the study of your word and for rightly dividing it, Lord. We thank you for Tamara, Lord, and uh, her role in the women's ministry and for the Thursday Bible study, Lord. We pray that you would just minister to the women through, uh, through your word to the, the women that come on Thursday mornings and Thursday evenings. And we thank you for that opportunity, Lord, uh, for them to, be, to grow in the knowledge of you for the men's study, Lord. We thank you for uh, Jason's faithfulness and leading that study, Lord. We pray that you would just continue uh, working through the men in our fellowship, Lord, that they would be godly leaders in their homes and in our community and in their businesses. We thank you for that. And Father, for the home fellowship leaders, we lift them up to you and pray that uh, they would be great facilitators, Lord, of uh, the discussions that go on uh, around your word and uh, that the people that attend there, Lord, would just grow in, in the knowledge of you, Lord, and that you would equip them to be, uh, to, for the ministry, Father. Lord, we lift up the children's ministry to you. We thank you again for Tamara and her leadership in that area. We pray for wisdom for her in leading that, Lord, as our body grows. Lord, we pray for additional uh, workers, Lord, to to lead the children, Lord, and that you would just do a work <clears throat> through those, those classrooms in the back of our building, Lord, to plant seeds in the young ones that come, whether they faithfully come every week or they just visit one time. Lord, we pray that uh, your word would be planted in those hearts, Lord, and, and that fruit would come from that. Father, we thank you for our high school and college ministry. We thank you for Ed and Marsha and the we pray for them, Lord. We pray that um, 
they would just continue to have a compassion or a passion and a compassion uh, for our youth, Lord. And Lord, we pray that these kids would be firm in their commitment to Christ. Lord, that they would be bold in their faith um, as they go through high school and on into college and into the workforce. Lord, we pray that they would have confidence in you and the, and the promises that you have, Lord, and that they would walk in them and that they would follow you all the days of their life. Father, for the junior high ministry, we pray for Paul and Jen. We pray that you would give them wisdom in reaching the kids that they are responsible for, and we pray that you would just help them to grow in, in first knowing who you are and then growing in you and in service to you. And Father, for our missionaries, we thank you for the missionaries that we have supported here at Calvary Chapel. Lord, we lift up Pat and Sue Apple in Israel. We pray that you would minister uh, to them and through them. We pray for uh, Shepherd Staff Prison Ministry in, in Russia. We pray, Lord, for those prisoners in Russia that are being given curriculum through this ministry uh, about, about you and Bibles, Lord, and that they're coming to faith in you, Lord. We just praise you for that and pray that you would continue that work. Thank you, Lord, that we can be a part, a small part of that ministry on the other side of the world. And Lord, we pray that you would just bless that ministry. And for Wycliffe Bible tra translators and the missionaries that we support there, we pray for Shelley Boyd in the Philippines as she works with young people, Lord. We pray that you would encourage her, Lord, that you would keep her healthy and that you would just give her a peace, Lord, that, uh, that we are praying for and that we are, the people back home are concerned for her and that we love her and pray that you encourage her father. And for Mitch and Christine Sorensen, evangelists in Nice, France, well, Lord, we pray for them and they've requested that we pray for divine appointments, Lord, as they, as they pass out tracts and witness in the streets of Nice, Lord, we pray that uh, they would just be faithful, Lord, to do what you've called them to do, and that they would be encouraged, Lord, uh, by your spirit to uh, continue spreading the gospel. And Lord, we pray for our worship ministry here at Calvary Chapel. Thank you so much for this, the rich music and the, the balance of hymns and contemporary music, Lord, and what a blessing that is. We pray for wisdom for Jason and the other members of the team, Lord, that you would continue to bless them, Lord, and that you would raise up additional people that would uh, just facilitate us worshiping you. And for the Silver Saints, Lord, we thank you for that ministry, and um, thank you, Lord, for such a vital role that our, our older saints have in our body, Lord. As Pastor Rob talked about this morning, Lord, that they have a ministry of prayer, but, Lord, they also have a ministry of of encouragement and of discipleship and may they continue to be used by you Lord as an example to those younger in the faith Father we also thank you for the service brigade and the great help ministry that that has been to our body Lord may you continue to, to use that and bless that ministry and for our young marrieds Lord we pray for Dennis and Judy and we thank you Lord for just a great time of life where people are newly married and starting families, and Lord, what a great ministry that is. Thank you for it. Let me continue to work in that. And for all of our other ministries, Lord, the ushers, the greeters, the prayer ministry, our security teams, Lord, all of these things, Lord, there's so many, Lord, that you have blessed us, so we thank you for them. And Lord, may you be glorified in all that we do um, in this ministry. Lord, may you continue to pour your blessing upon us and may we be a blessing to you father in jesus name we pray amen and thank you dan thank you for praying for our ministries good evening great to see everyone this evening and one more ministry that we have is uh just an opportunity for us to get to know one another we have dinners for eight there's a sign up this is the last sunday to sign up for that great time to get together in fellowship I was told, uh, Kent and Michelle, dinners for eight, right here, dinners for eight. Yeah, you obviously didn't know about this, but uh, here it is, sign up for that. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Um, 
Elaine, you have some special guests here tonight, I see. Would you, in, <laughs> would you introduce them for us? We're still small enough that we can do this, right? We can do this on a Sunday night. Scott and Kristen, wonderful. Welcome from Minnesota. Glad to have you here. You came at the right time, guys. It's cooling off a little bit. A little bit. Uh, last couple weeks, it has been unbearable. Um, Scott did uh, Percy's funeral. Don't we miss Percy? You know, Percy used to sit back here. Love Percy. And um, Scott was able to do his funeral because Percy's in heaven. And so it was a time of celebration. A great time of sadness because we will miss Percy. I miss him so much. I knew him the last couple years of his life. But what an encouragement and joy that man was. And uh, Scott, you did a wonderful job, and you just gave the glory to the Lord, and it was just wonderful. So, so thank you. Great to have you here this evening. All right, let's open in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. And let's ask the Lord's blessing on tonight's teaching. Father, we come before you, Lord, humbly to receive what you have for us. How many people in the world will be just subscribing to all kinds of philosophies and thoughts and categories and they'll be at the movies and they'll be taking in all of the lessons from Hollywood and they'll be listening to worldly radio or whatever it is. And yet we come before you, Lord, to hear from you and that you would change our hearts and our, our minds and our lives, that we would have your perspective in living and we know that we've got to live in this world, but Lord, I pray that this world would not be the great influencer of our lives, but that you would. And we give you the opportunity now, Lord, to speak to us, to influence us, to change us, to make us into the image of your Son by the teaching and the preaching and the receiving of your word. We ask your blessing upon this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Samuel 15, let's start in verse 1. After this, it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now remember, Absalom has been brought back into the kingdom. But after two years, David had not yet received him. David had yet not recognized Absalom as his son coming back into the kingdom. And of course, this was a great insult to Absalom. Here he is, the king's son. And the king will not receive him and acknowledge him. And so this is an insult to him. It is an embarrassment to him. And so finally he demands that Joab take him to his father the king. And he sends for Joab, but Joab won't have anything to do with him either. Joab won't answer his call. And finally, in great frustration, Absalom tells one of his servants, Hey, go burn Joab's field. Just light it on fire. That'll get his attention. And sure enough, it does. And Joab comes running and Absalom says to him, Why have you not brought me to the king? And so Joab does present him, Absalom, to David, his father. And David does recognize his son. But it would appear that David does not fully forgive his son. It's not a full restoration. It is not a full reconciliation. They go through the motions. David does kiss him and, and does acknowledge him, but... He's not brought into that full place of relationship with his father. It's only partial. And so Absalom will become a very bitter man here. All of this angst and anger and frustration bottled up inside of him. Now, I am not making Absalom purely the victim here. He is not. We will see his true character come out, to be sure. But there is a caution here for us that are fathers. There's a great caution for us. We want to bring out the best in our kids, and we want to discipline out the worst, right? When we see good things in our children, fathers, we want to encourage that. We want to say, wonderful, I see that you're a hard worker, I see that you are, are very grateful, these are good things, and I want to pour my encouragement into my children's lives for these things. But when we see things that need to be corrected, those things need to be taken care of. They need to be disciplined out of the lives of our children. And it may just even be sitting your child down and talking to them, whatever it is. But we want to encourage what is good. We want to discipline what is wrong. David does not do that. Not at all. He is being a very neglectful father at this point in his life. And David is going to provoke Absalom to wrath. Though certainly what Absalom does here is his fault, we can say that David does not stir up what is good and what is right in his son. 
and he does not correct what is wrong. And so David is going to allow his son to venture down the path that is going to disrupt and destroy, really, or damage anyway, much of the kingdom of Israel. So while David is ignoring Absalom, Absalom basically says, hey, I'll make a name for myself. Dad, if you won't have anything to do with me, if you won't recognize me, if you won't give me the full blessing of being your son, I'll go out and I'll make a name for me. And he provides himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Can you picture that? I mean, a chariot is a big deal in that day. And it wasn't really something done by Israel. Israel did not have chariots. They were to trust in the Lord. And so horses and chariots, remember when David captured the horses and chariots? He hamstrung them and burned the chariots. Okay? So when Absalom goes out and gets a chariot for himself, this is really a standout. I mean, this is like driving a big, giant Cadillac. No offense if you have a big, giant Cadillac. This is like driving a big, giant Cadillac in a third world vi village. You know, you're really standing out. And 50 men to run before you. So he's really making a name for himself here. Really trying to stand out. This is quite conspicuous. Now what he's doing here is he, he is projecting an image of power and importance. He's making himself significant. Now, every single man wants significance. We want that, don't we, men? We want respect. We want to be honored. And that's good. That's not wrong for a man to want these things. It just needs to be done in the right way. We need to let our significance, men, come from the Lord. And let it be gained through righteousness, through hard work, through diligence. To be righteous men and to be known that way. We need others to look at us and to know that we are men of integrity, that we are men of obedience and dedication to the Lord. And that's where our significance and respect needs to come from. And that's how we are to be known. Absalom is going about this all the wrong way. He's trying to make a name for himself by his own effort. And it's a caution to beware of pride. To beware of pride. Pride is going to eat Absalom alive. He's exalting himself. Verse 2. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was, whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would call to him and say, What city are you from? And he would say, Your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me that I would give him justice. Uh-oh. Absalom is headed for no good here, isn't he? He has found his father David's weakness in the kingdom. It would appear that David, at this stage in his reign, has started to neglect the people. He started to neglect the justice of the people. Now remember that Moses had appointed judges to decide cases for the nation of Israel. Remember his father-in-law had suggested to him, hey, look, you need to set up some people to assist you. So when the cases come, you don't hear all of the cases for all of the nation. And so establish these different elders in the land that will hear the cases and only the most difficult cases will come to you it would appear that david does not do that now and he is neglecting the people he does not hear their cases now you talk about frustration breaking out in a population i mean this is going to stir up the entire nation if someone has cheated you if someone has stolen from you they've taken from you and you have nowhere to take your claim how frustrating is that for the people of god and so Absalom sees this chink in the armor, and he provides an answer for the people. And he pre presents himself, or situates himself, right at the gate where the elders are. And when the people come in, and they're coming into the city, and they want to present their case to the king, there was nobody there but Absalom. Oh, your case is good, your case is right, it should be heard, but the king is just too busy to hear you. If I were the judge... Boy, if I had a place of authority and position in the land, then I would hear your case, and I would give you justice. Boy, he's really appealing to the people and their desire to have what is right. They're frustrated in their minds and their hearts, and he says, I can fill that need. And the idea is this. Look, David, my father, the king, he lives in a big palace. He's got a lot of wives. He drinks out of silver goblets. He just doesn't have time for you. But if I were king... 
If I were in the place of authority, I would have time for you and I would give you what you need and what is right. And this is what every disgruntled and frustrated heart wants to hear. I mean, the need and the desire for justice is good. It's just that Absalom is coming about and doing it the wrong way. And so Absalom is offering himself as the solution, the one that would provide justice in the land and give people what they need. Verse 5, And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. This is called rebellion. That's what's going on here. And it is well thought out. It has been well planned. Absalom is knowingly stirring up the hearts of the people against his own father. He sees the weakness there in the kingdom and he exploits it for his own personal gain. Now Absalom should have, if he were a man with a right heart, should have assisted his father. He should have gone to David the king and said, look, dad, hey, we got a problem here. There are people lining up at the gate of Jerusalem and they're looking for justice and there's no one to hear their plea and their cause. You need to appoint some judges. You need to make this right. Our kingdom has to have justice or the people are going to revolt. But he doesn't do that. He keeps it from his father the king and he presents himself as the solution and the answer. Now we have to be careful, Christians, because this happens in the church, doesn't it? It happens in the church all of the time with too much frequency. Now, I am not, for a moment, saying that the pastor is king. That's not what I'm saying. Not for one moment. But I am saying that God has given authority to the church. I am saying that God has given authority to the church to speak in a place of, of direction, of guidance, even correction and discipline, as the Apostle Paul talks about in the New Testament. This is biblical, and this is right. But then people can so easily come along into the church and say, well, hey, you know, that pastor, those elders, and they're nice people and all, but they really don't understand things like I do. And they start to carve out a following for themselves. And they get a little Bible study going. Not wrong to have a Bible study in and of itself, but it's the motive behind it. The motive is what is the issue. They get a little Bible study going for themselves, and then they begin to subtly contradict the leadership of the church, and they begin to tell people, you see, if I were in charge, I would give you really good doctrine, and I would give you proper theology. These guys just don't fully get it. And they start to carve out this little following and move them further and further away, and when the time is right, like Absalom, they spring the trap. Paul, remember, Meeting with the elders of Ephesus told them in Acts 20, 29. And this is very insightful, very enlightening. He said, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. That's telling, isn't it? The Apostle Paul telling the elders of Ephesus as he was saying goodbye to them. Remember that scene? He meets them there. He's going to Jerusalem. He knows it's the last time. He knows he's going to be arrested there and carried away. This has already been prophesied. He goes to the elders there. He hugs them. He kisses them. It's a very tender moment. And he says to them, be careful. There are going to be a number of people that rise up from with your own ranks. And they're going to be like savage wolves and carve out a following for themselves. And it's wrong. Watch out for this. It happened to David with Absalom. It happened to Jesus with Judas. It happened to the Apostle Paul with so many trying to undermine the authority of the Apostle Paul. And that's why again and again when the Apostle Paul writes his letters, he has to defend himself as an apostle appointed by Jesus Christ. You ever wonder why Paul writes that? It's because he's saying, look, there are people that are undermining what I'm saying and what I'm doing. But I've been appointed by God. I'm an apostle in the Lord Jesus Christ because so many wanted to destroy him. You know, I never hear of these things with the false movements. I don't hear about this. Maybe it happens. They seem to be very loyal to the cause. I never hear about the church split in the Mormon church down the street. Or the Jehovah's Witnesses, boy, they had a really rough church split over there. I don't hear about that. You just think, why? Because Satan is attacking the church, isn't he? He wants to destroy the church. He's not out to destroy Mormonism. 
So this is satanic. It's overt rebellion against the authority that God has placed in the church. It is the spirit of Absalom. Verse 7. Now it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. For your servant took a vow while I dwelt at Geshur and Syria, saying, If the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. So this says that after 40 years. Okay, we've got a problem with that, don't we? Some Bibles say four years. How many of your Bibles say four years? Okay, many of your Bibles say four years. Mine says 40 years. Some think that perhaps this is a copyist error, or some think that maybe the 40 refers to the time all the way back since David was, was crowned as king by Samuel, or anointed to be king by Samuel. We don't know specifically. We don't have the answer. Why the discrepancy? But after some time, and it may be just four years, maybe that's what it means, when Absalom feels like he has a following in place, he asks David to go to Hebron. Now remember that Hebron is where David was crowned to be king. That's where David first serves as king over the tribe of Judah before he becomes the king over all of Israel. So Absalom knows exactly what he's doing. He is plotting something here. He's doing all of this in secret, and he's going to go and make himself the leader of Israel. Now, if the Lord were in this, if this were right, and if this were good, why is he doing this in secret? Why is he plotting all of this conspiracy quietly and behind the scenes? You know, I've told my children, I've told my own family, you know, if you're sneaking, you better be hiding my birthday present. Because if you're not, then sneaking is wrong. You know it's wrong, and the Lord is convicting your heart. And what Absalom is doing, he's being sneaky. If he were doing what is right, there would be no need to do any of this in secret. Verse 9, And the king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went two hundred men, invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gileonite, or Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy grew strong, for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. This is sad, isn't it? So Absalom goes to Hebron, and he brings some people with him, and some of them have no idea why they're even going. They're saying, yeah, let's go to Hebron with Absalom. And then he sends out spies throughout the whole land, and he says, when you hear the trumpet sound, then let all of Israel know, as these, these messengers would pass the word along from city to city, that Absalom is our new king. Absalom now reigns over the land in Hebron. He has become the head of our nation now. What a stab in the heart to David. Here is David's own son, and he leads a rebellion against him. Here's David. He's defended Israel from all of their enemies. David loves Israel. He has fought for the nation. He has served the nation. He has ruled well. Yes, he's done some things wrong, but overall, he's been a very good king. He's ruled very well. In fact, he will be Israel's greatest king, except for Jesus himself, of course. David fought the Philistines, and he was victorious. He had victory over the Jebusites, the Syrians, the Edomites, the Moabites, and many more. But here one arises from his own family that will have victory over him, that will defeat him. It'll be temporary, but this one will do David great harm. You know, betrayal is one of the hardest setbacks of all, isn't it? When you've suffered a personal betrayal. Betrayal takes the life right out of you. Your mind just reels in the pain. You think, look at all the... I did for a person. Look at all that I, I poured into that person's life. Look at how this person used my friendship and my love and my support against me to harm me, to try and destroy me. They've used it as a weapon to overthrow me. You know, when a husband leaves a wife and runs off with another, now obviously it can work in reverse, and there are times that it does, but mostly, in the counseling that I've seen, mostly it's the other way. It's a husband that runs off, and he leaves his wife, and he goes after another. Here is the wife for fulfilling her duty and calling, tending the family. And the man checks out, and he goes after another. One of the sickest and most twisted reactions, and it must be of the flesh, 
is that people rally around the husband to show him empathy. And you just think, what is happening here? And even Christians can say, well, you know, we need to show him love. We need to show him kindness. We need to show him, you know, that he is still accepted. We need to show the love of Jesus to him. The answer is no, you don't. You need to rebuke the sin. That is the right thing to do. You need to exhort that man to righteousness. You say something like, look, you've left your wife. Was there something unbiblical in your wife that I don't know about? Because to me, it looks like what you're doing is very unbiblical. It looks like you're living in sin. And you need to repent. You need to make this right before God. And I cannot have fellowship with you in your sin. Just think if the body of Christ did that faithfully. How it would change the behavior and the actions in the church. But it is my experience that this is not what happens. Generally, that man will have good fellowship and good friends. Oh, there may be a time of awkwardness, but so often, as I said, people will say, well, we need to be very understanding to this guy. We need to just show him the love of Jesus. No, you need to rebuke him. You need to show him justice. And then the woman, of course, she gets double jeopardy, doesn't she? She's not only been left by her husband, but now all of his friends are rallying around him. And they're saying, well, you know, we need to be understanding. We need to hear both sides of the story. You know, problems have two sides to it and these kinds of things. Nope, nope, we need to stand up for what is right. So Absalom so often get treated very kindly because we don't want to offend them. Wrong. We need to rebuke them. And so we see here a good portion of Israel rallies to Absalom. And it's wrong. It is wrong what you're seeing here. This conspiracy grows strong and shame on the nation of Israel for taking part in this, for having anything to do with it. Verse 13. Now a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Oh, 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 think of what David is going through at this moment. Oh, what a stab in the heart. His own kingdom, the kingdom which God had given him, the kingdom to which he was appointed to, the people he loved and served and ruled over well, the people he defended and fought for, they turn on him in a second and they join Absalom. People are so fickle and everyone loves a good scandal, don't they? And here we see a principle that emerges from Scripture it is so often, I would say, almost always true, and that is that the majority is almost always wrong. The majority is almost always wrong. That's hard to say when you live in a democracy, right? <laughs> the majority is almost always wrong. The people turn on David and they join Absalom. Verse 14. So David said to all his servants who were with him in Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee. Or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And so David gathers his house to flee Jerusalem. David is a defeated and broken man here. He's defeated in his heart and his spirit, and he knows his own nation is turned against him. And David knows that if he stays in Jerusalem, it will not go well. Because if he stays there then when Absalom comes with his forces, there'll be a great and bloody fight, and many will die. And so he says, let's just flee. Let's get out of here and go find safety. How awful for David to think that his own son would kill him. Verse 15, And the king's servants said to the king, We are your servants, ready to do whatever my lord the king commands. Then the king went out with all his household after him. But the king left ten women concubines to keep the house. And the king went out with all the people after him and stopped at the outskirts. Then all his servants passed before him, and all the Cherethites, all the Pelethites, and all the Gittites, 600 men who had followed him from Gath, passed before the king. A very sad scene. Very pitiful, isn't it? David leaves ten concubines behind, kind of like a mistress, to take care of the house. But everyone else packs up to retreat, to flee from Absalom. And David then watches all of his servants, all of his family, get things together and to leave the palace, to leave Jerusalem, and to head on out. And they all pass before him. And then David must have stopped at the outskirts of the city and looked back in disbelief. Oh, Lord, what has happened? Everything that I have poured my life into is now gone in a moment. Now, obviously, there are particular faults of Absalom here, and there are particular faults of the people of Israel, to be sure. Not removing any of that blame at all. Not excusing them. But 
if we want to step back and look from 35,000 feet at the big picture here, this is because David sinned with Bathsheba. Remember, he invited all of this into his life and into his home. This is ultimately the result and the fallout of sin. Men, a great caution to us, isn't it? Don't let sin and compromise into your home. We are the gatekeepers, men. We are the guardians. And so often it works the other way, doesn't it? It's, it's the wife, it's the mom who says, you know, we really shouldn't watch that. We really should get up tomorrow to go to church. You know, we really should turn that off. Men, if you hear that, that should be a conviction to you. Uh-oh, I'm not doing my job. It's not mom's job. It's not the, the wife's place to say, hey, that should not come into our home. It should be the man to stand up and say, hey, turn that off. That garbage is not coming in here. We protect our homes from sin. The results of sin and compromise are devastating. And so often you see it in the lives of the children. That's who it destroys. You know, if you have any time in the body of Christ, for those of you that are a little bit older, you've seen this story I don't know how many times, where mom and dad compromise a little bit, but they're secure with the Lord. And they're just playing and dabbling with sin a little bit, but it destroys the children, doesn't it? They don't have a relationship with the Lord. And that compromise takes place in their hearts and they walk away from the Lord, or if they ever even knew Him. And so this ha happens too often in the body of Christ. Verse 19, Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, How do you like that name? Ittai the Gittite, Why are you also going with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your own place. In fact, you came only yesterday. Should I make you wander up and down with us today? Since I go, I know not where. Return and take your brethren back. Mercy and truth be with you. But Ittai answered the king and said, As the Lord lives, and as my Lord the king lives, surely in whatever place my Lord the king shall be, where, whether in death or life, even there also your servant will be. So David said to Ittai, Go and cross over. Then Ittai the Gittite and all his men and all the little ones who were with him crossed over. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people crossed over. The king himself also crossed over the brook Kidron, which is right there to the east of Jerusalem. And all the people crossed over toward the way of the wilderness. So we're introduced here to Ittai the Gittite, and we see that he's very loyal to David. Now here, David is suffering this great betrayal. His heart is heavy. He's probably beside himself, not even knowing really what's happening. It's just so overwhelming. And this guy, Ittai the Gittite, shows up, and he is completely loyal to David. It's just the goodness and the grace of God at this moment to encourage David. And say, okay, yes, the kingdom has turned against you, but I'm going to show you little voices of loyalty, little voices of my grace in your life. And Ittai the Gittite is that man. You know, friendship in the time of need is friendship indeed, isn't it? Friendship in the time of persecution is the proof of a real friend, and that's what David has here. And Ittai is going to be very loyal to the king. He's going to be a great encouragement to David here. All the people that go with David are truly loyal to him, because if they are caught with David, they're going to be executed. That's how it works in that time. Take yourself out of the modern era. Take yourself out of America right now. Go back to the ancient times. And even in some places of the world today, when there's a revolution going on and you join with the old authority, if you're caught, you will be executed, no questions asked. So they are taking their lives into their own hands by going with David. It is true, unquestionable loyalty to David and to the Lord. Now I mention that because the same thing is true in our lives, in our service with the Lord Jesus. We are taking our lives into our hands. Now, mostly here in the United States, we will suffer some sort of persecution, but, you know, we're really not looking at death for following the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you recognize that much of the world today to follow the Lord means that you are literally putting your life on the line? If you even have, and I am not exaggerating here, if you even have a copy of the Bible in North Korea, you will be publicly executed. These have been recorded. I read about them. One woman was caught with a Bible. She was taken out in her small village and executed in front of that village. It goes on today. 
But even here in the United States, when we walk closely with Jesus, when we really serve him, there's still a price to pay. And I believe that we're getting closer to the time that when even in the United States of America, we are going to pay a very large price to walk with Jesus, to be faithful. And the Lord knows who his true disciples are. But it is so important, just like with the scene of David's departure from Jerusalem, all of those that walked with David loyally in the end are going to be rewarded. And the same thing is true with us. You walk with Jesus now, even when times are tough, we know that he's the victor in the end, and we will be rewarded by our faithfulness, in our faithfulness to him. So walk closely with the Lord, because in the end, Jesus wins. We love him because he first loved us, and he will reward his faithful servants. Verse 24, there was Zadok also, and all the Levites with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God, and they set down, uh, and they set down the ark of God. And Abiathar went up, until all the people had finished crossing over the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says thus, I have no delight in you, here I am, let him do to me as seems good to him. So Abiathar and Zadok were loyal to David as the high priest, and they know that David is anointed by the Lord. They know that the anointing of God is not on Absalom. It's on David. And so they are loyal to him. And they bring the Ark of the Covenant out to follow David. They go into the temple. They grab that Ark. They follow the priestly way of moving that thing. They get the priest. They put the poles through it. And they march out. They're going to go with David. Now remember that David was the one that brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem to make Jerusalem the spiritual capital of Israel. And so the high priests are essentially saying, hey, if you're leaving, we're leaving with you, and we're taking the ark with us. But David says, no, 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 take it back. Go back to Jerusalem. And we see even in the midst of this great wounding that David has tremendous faith. He says, if the Lord is for me, if the Lord sees that there is something good in me and something right in me, then he will bring me back. He'll bring me back. But if there is no delight of the Lord in me, then I trust my life to the Lord. I put my life in his hands. That's tremendous faith, isn't it? Tremendous faith. I mean, David could have said, I'm the king. Come on, let's go and execute these people now. Or he could have demanded something in his pride, but he doesn't. He says, you know what? I'm going to put it all in the hands of the Lord. And so even at this point, in this point of great wounding, we see that tremendous character of David. He just trusts the Lord completely. Verse 27. Then the king also said to Zadok the priest, are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahimaaz, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore, Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. So the ark, as David commands, goes back to Jerusalem, but Zadok and Abiathar are going to act as informants, and their sons will carry messages back to David. Verse 30, so David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up and he had his head covered and went barefoot, ouch, and all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. Now this is a picture of great mourning and defeat, as you can well imagine. The men all cover their heads and they're, they're weeping out loud to the Lord. And remember, and I always like to point this out because we're a Western audience, right? I am definitely a Western man, you know, and when you cry, it needs to be very, very private, and no one needs to see you, and you say, oh, I didn't cry. Mm -mm. <laughs> That's how we are, aren't we? Uh, David's from the Middle East. It's not that way. They wept loud, so you can just imagine the wailing that is going on, just weeping and crying, probably throwing dust up in the air, you know, tearing their clothes, weeping as they go, so you have this whole group of of 600 plus just leaving Jerusalem going up the Mount of Olives and of course he's in bare feet probably weeping because that hurts a lot ouch ouch oh Lord but this is a very sad sad scene the Mount of Olives is very steep and so it's a slow go just picture all of this group winding up the Mount of Olives as they're crying out to the Lord mourning for this great calamity that is taking place and then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. 
And David said, Oh Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Okay, this name Ahithophel shows up. And this is a big name, and you'll hear this a lot. If you know people compare someone to a, a bad counselor, someone that has betrayed you, they'll use the name Ahithophel. Now, all of this is part of the great betrayal to David. Not only is Absalom, his own son, turned against him, but also Ahithophel. Now, who's Ahithophel? He was David's own personal counselor. So the king at that time would have counselors. And it would appear here that Ahithophel was his closest counselor. I mean, he knows the intimacy of David, how he thinks, how the family works, all of the decisions that are made. He's been right there with David the whole way. He's been a trusted man. He's been given this sacred honor to speak into the king's life. They know one another. No doubt David loves Ahithophel. And yet Ahithophel uses that place to turn against David and to betray him. And it very well may be a root of bitterness in Ahithophel seething against David after all of these years. It would appear from Scripture that Ahithophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. We learn in 2 Samuel 11.3, And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Remember that? David said, Hey, bring that young woman to me. And someone said, Hey, this is the wife of Uriah the Hittite, the daughter of Eliam. And then we learn in 2 Samuel 23.34, Eliam is the son of Ahithophel the Gileonite. So that would make Bathsheba his granddaughter. So Ahithophel may have watched all of this happen with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, and he may have told himself, someday I'm going to even the score. Someday I'm going to make this right. Someday I'm going to get back at David. We don't know his motive. It's not said here in the Bible, to be sure. But this very well may be what is happening. And he joins the rebellion to strike against David. Now, either way, it's a great blow against David, a great betrayal. David even wrote of this great betrayal. It was so much on his heart, he actually included it in the Psalms. In Psalm 41, 9, David wrote this, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. He was writing of Ahithophel. It was devastating betrayal to him. It happened to Jesus as well, didn't it? Judas, who Jesus loved. We never have any indication of all of the years of Jesus walking with his 12 disciples, their three, three and a half years in his earthly ministry, that he treated Judas any differently. It wasn't like Jesus said, okay, you 11, come over here, and Judas. Hey, let's get something to eat, and Judas. No, he loved Judas. He treated Judas just like all of his other disciples. And yet Judas used that place of position, that love, that sacred honor and trust to be one of the disciples of Christ. And he used it against Jesus to betray him. Verse 32, Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. There was Hushai the archite coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, If you go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now also be your servant, then you may defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. And do you not know, or do you not have Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, with you there? Therefore it will be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall tell to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Indeed, they have with them their two sons, Ahamaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, went into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. So Hushai the archite, he came out to meet David on his retreat from Jerusalem. And he is mourning as well. His clothing is torn. He's weeping. He's very expressive in the fact that I am with you, David. I love you, David. I can't believe this is happening to you. And so Hushai goes out to meet them. He's put dust on his head, and he is suffering along with David. How comforting that is. When we are suffering, to have someone say, I want to suffer with you. I am brokenhearted right alongside of you. It's so wonderful in the body of Christ when we suffer together. When we bear one another's burdens. When we come alongside each other. And we let people know, I am hurting for you. 
I know what you're going through right now. And I want to just commiserate with you. I just want to make myself available to you. I'm, I'm suffering. I'm wounded inside because you, the one that I love, my friend, is suffering. How meaningful that is. How wonderful it is in the body of Christ to have those kind of faithful friends that will mourn with you. Paul told the Galatians in Galatians 6 too, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Isn't that needed? Isn't that needed? You know, one of the little things that we do in this ministry, and it's so wonderful when I hear about people taking part in this, is we take someone a meal. It's not a lot. You know, you're not going to solve anyone's problem by taking them a meal. But what are you doing? You're suffering with them. Hey, I, I heard you got something really hard going on in your life. I heard that you're dealing with something, or, or I just want to be a blessing to you. Come, let me, let me give a meal to you. Let me just come alongside of you. Let me just take a moment to pray for you and just say, I, I'm right there with you. Paul told the Romans in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And that's exactly what Hushai the archite does here. David, how could this happen? David, what's going on? I don't know what's going on, but David, I'm, I'm wounded inside for you. I'm dying inside because you are David. And how encouraging that is to him. And then David sent him back to Jerusalem and that he would relay the information that he receives from Absalom, that he would relay it to Zadok and Abiathar. And that information would then come to David. And all of this is to counter the counsel of Ahithophel. So David ultimately is suffering for the sin that he allowed to come into his home. But how wonderful it is that the Lord has given him encouragers to come alongside him. To come alongside him at this moment and say, you know what, David? We're going to suffer along with you. We're going to stand loyal to you. We're going to keep your eyes and our eyes on the Lord and to trust in him. Now, ultimately, David will prevail here. Ultimately, the Lord will bring him back in victory. But this is a very hard chapter, as you can imagine, in David's life. 